Welcome everybody to the Scale Up Show. This is your host, Ryan Staley, and I have a very special guest back with me today. I have Cal York, who is the CEO of York Investments, has had previously had a $200 million, well, more than that, I guess it grew from zero to 200 million as a chief revenue officer, now is running his own advisory as a service and VC combo company. Kyle, welcome. Happy to have you back, man. Yeah, Ryan, thanks for having me again. You were on a roll last time, and we still got some good stuff to talk about. So if you did not check out episode number one, he talks about how leveraging tech-enabled services with AI, advisory as a service, the VC combo advisory business model. And we're going to go a little bit deeper into what we kind of ended off with. And so essentially what we're going to talk about today is understanding a little bit more about the uniqueness of that I guess, services as a business model, if you will. So give us like your theory and background on that, because you've always worked in SaaS, Kyle. So I'd love to hear why you kind of pivoted to this model. Yeah, well, sure. I mean, I think first and foremost, having the operational success, um, and especially in my first two startups with technical founder CEOs, made me realize that there's a real gap on the go-to-market side for companies. Um, I also realized that I didn't want to just retire and be a board member or investor. And I was doing a lot of angel investing and advising while moonlighting when building our company dying and selling it to Oracle. So I looked at how do I continually go be an operator, but also be an investor to get skin in the game of my favorite startups, but not just like go do that alone and be like a solo founder, one man band, right? How do I build something repeatable, scalable? Uh, and, you know, I think what it really comes down to is SaaS has truly become the subscription business model, right? And that's a business model I know like the back of my hand. I've spent my entire career to date myself uh, building software and SaaS businesses and wanted to go take that expertise and experience, but productize it and, and build it into a platform and build it into a repeatable, replicable, scalable offering for the startup landscape so that we could impact as many startups as possible. And that when startups wanted to work with York IE, they weren't just calling just to talk to me, right? They were actually coming to a philosophy and a, and a, and a, and a vision and a mission alignment that they uh, could see real value in ROI from. Okay. Love that. So how do you productize it, man? Like, how did you approach productization of services? Because that's something that I know a lot of folks struggle with. And what I'm even seeing, too, is not just people want SaaS, but people want results as a service. So would love your feedback. Yeah, on totally. That. Yeah. So I think, I mean, first of all, it was a lot of listening, right? Like working with dozens and dozens and dozens of startups, um, talking to lots of founders, absorbing a lot of information in the market from shows like this and others to hear what people are struggling with and what they need help with. And we basically done is we've created this advisory as a service platform that has uh, different uh, subscription services, different modules uh, with different tiers of service across R&D, go to market and GNA. And so really just kind of tried to align towards the the P&L and what companies need to invest in anyway, and give them an option for a near third party kind of operational extension of their team to help them with that growth. And then as we discussed a lot at nauseum in the last call, try to tech enable, uh, AI enable, uh, offshore enable, so that we can deliver that low cost and, and repeatably, but also um, high margin for us so that it's a actual scalable, profitable enterprise. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I love the modulization. So like, are you seeing this as well? Cause like I'm, and I don't know if it's like we get conditioned as consumers, but the more and more leaders I talk to, they just want shit done for them. <laughs> they don't want to yeah. buy a tool anymore. They don't want to buy a set. They just want stuff done for them and they want to pay for that. Yep. Is that what you're seeing as like an overarching principle as well? And I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. I mean, I think everybody's getting squeezed for, for, efficiency, right? Uh, and it, it feels like it's efficiency for efficiency sake. On the go to market side, it used <laughs> to be like, if you know, pour as much money as you can into your sales team and into your demand gen programs and into tools. And, you know, think about the amount of like market MarTech and sales tech tools that were and CS tools that were created and everyone would just buy them to try them. Right. And, and, you know, I think the money was really flowing and it was okay. And it was, you know, fine if you were burning a lot of money, as long as you were growing, because the market was rewarding you for that with high multiples, right? I think now every go-to-market function, every company in general across R&D, go-to-market and GNA is being challenged with how do you do more with less and how do you do it more efficiently? If you are leveraging technology, tell me how that you can do that and it's less expensive than something else with a 
the same or higher ROI, right? Um, and I think that's happening with all services vendors. And I think what we saw in our model was, you know, historically, you know, you're, you're first of all, you're never calling McKinsey or Accenture or KPMG or Bain and Co., uh, even the Gartners of the world until you're big, right? And have big budgets and, you know, get into the pay to play game with that, right? Um, so who do you do, right? You, you bring in a bunch of boutique agencies or different firms or independent advisors or consultants or fractionals, and you try to glue it all together. And I, I thought there was an opportunity for a one-stop resource hub for that. Um, secondarily, you know, we're not alone in seeing a lot of um, services businesses in other industries uh, who are you know, becoming tech-enabled services or uh, managed service providers on top of other technologies or um, SaaS businesses entirely, right? Or SaaS plus services businesses emerge. And so this is happening sort of in every sector and in every industry and in every market segment anyway, where technology and AI and automation is building the next great companies, right? And so I sort of looked at it as like, if a McKinsey or a Bain, or, I mean, I, we have a bunch of advisors from Deloitte, for example. I mean, it was founded 160 years ago. Like if it was founded today and didn't have all the um, you know, the, the historics and all the uh, legacy and tech debt, like wh- how would they be built? Well, they'd be built data, automation, AI, technology, subscription, global by, by first class principle, right? So this is what's happening across lots of sectors in ours, you know, sassifying sort of management consulting professional services. Um, it's really about building a platform, trying to integrate it the best you can uh, and, and bring it to market. Yeah. That's, I love that analysis that you just broke down. Like that's what uh, basically PwC is. Uh, did you see that partnership that PwC had with OpenAI at all? Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. I saw the headline. Yeah. So they invested in, in like a 40,000 user enterprise license. I think it was maybe it's 20,000, but in the tens of thousands. Right. And then they're actually their first like reseller partner for that. And then I think they're also like selling. So basically they're using that, reselling it. And then I imagine just dropping services on top of it. Right. Um, so well, this is the funny thing. Like we're, we're, I always say to people like, so, so we're kind of in two sectors, right? We're in the professional services, management consulting, you know, analyst sort of sector. And we're in the financial services, venture capital, private equity sector. There's, there's nothing wrong with either of those industries. There are monster companies. There's lots of uh, mid market companies. There's lots of small businesses. There's lots of consultancies and boutiques. There's even a lot of sole proprietors that do well in that, the, both those lanes, right? Um, they're not broken. They've made a lot of people a lot of money. They've impacted the world in a great, in a great way. But every industry can be disrupted and, and models can be evolved. And you know, I hope if they're founded by entrepreneurs, companies are going to take a different spin or slant on, on the company they want to build in that, in that sector. And that's really what we're doing in, in this sector. Um, And we work just with so many founders who are doing the same, whether it's in supply chain or manufacturing or, you know, um, you know, senior care or uh, the meat and processing industry. Like we have companies across all these sectors that if you looked at them all in isolation, you'd say, what the heck do they have to do with one another? And what they're doing is bringing technology, AI, automation um, and um, the subscription business model to those sectors, right? And mm-hmm. so there's a lot of commonality across them. And those businesses tend to be founded by um, people with real world experience in those industry sectors that um, feel like they can build something to, to evolve that industry and innovate in that industry and, and, and make it, make a global, global impact. Yeah, I think that's good. So it's 60 seconds or less, because I, I want to be sensitive to your time. Like what's your, your view and what's the answer for the future over the next three years, especially with how fast is everything's changing specifically for that business model? Like, how are you kind of approaching it? It's a tough question to answer in a minute. Yeah. I mean, very flexibly. I think the, um, our, our economy, our world, our politics are all kind of chaotic right now. And, you know, I think everybody's looking for a little bit, like a little bit of like uh, uh, a lowering of the heat, I think that's out there everywhere. And I think that has a trickle down effect, especially to early stage startups, right? You've, You've seen uh, IPO markets closed. You've seen late stage funding round markets closed. You've seen M&A markets closed. Uh, and that trickles down to illiquidity, you know, at the, at the earliest stages of startups and entrepreneurship and investing, right? And I think, you know, we need that all to unlock and open up. Um, 
and I have you know strong faith that the entrepreneurial class is going to make a huge impact on the next couple of decades. Love that, man. All right. Well, thanks for being on, Kyle. It was awesome having you on for part two. Where can people find you? Where can they find out more about York Investments? Yeah. So uh, the firm is York.ie. Um, that's our that's our domain name. Uh, we also are across social profiles at York Growth, uh, and I'm K York Twenty on the same on the same uh, networks. Love it. Thanks for visiting us again, Kyle. It was great having you on the show, man. Yeah. Thanks for having me.